There are some good people suggesting that we should pass something like a Pastor Protection Act, either federally or in our several state governments, in order to protect pastors who do not want to perform so-called homosexual marriage. I'm going to explain to you why, even though it sounds good at first blush, it's a bad idea and we need to oppose it. I'm Randall Terry. This is Voice of Resistance. <laughs> Those who forsake the law praise the wicked. Those who uphold the law resist them. Welcome to the Voice of Resistance. Here's your host, Randall Terry. Paul wrote that we are all one body and that as Christians, when one member of the body suffers, we all suffer. I believe it, I don't remember which of the founders of the Republic it was who said kind of jokingly to the people who were fomenting revolution against King George III, he said, we can hang together or we will all hang separately. That's what we're facing, people. We're facing the unraveling of this culture. And if we allow them to separate us from each other, we are going to be the weaker for it. Um, Alito said uh, he, in, his, uh, in his dissent, he said, I assume that those who cling to old beliefs will be able to whisper their thoughts in the recesses of their homes. But if they repeat those views in public, they will risk being labeled as bigots and treated as such by governments, employers, and schools. In other words, Alito said, get ready for persecution because it's coming. Government, state, local, federal governments are going to descend upon those who resist the new orthodoxy. Employers are going to say, if you won't do this, you're fired. Schools are now going to be teaching our children things that were unspeakable just a few years ago in my lifetime, things that they are going to say are normal and praiseworthy and beautiful and expressions of goodness, blah, blah, blah. You could not even discuss them in mixed company, much less teach these abominable sins to small children. We have an obligation to stand together and to resist and Giving pastors an exemption will not help. And it will make their condemnation of this evil ring hollow. If I can say something and fear no repercussion, then is it really courage? If I've asked the state to protect me so that I can say what the Lord wants me to say, am I trusting in the Lord? Or am I trusting in the exemption that the state gave me? Let them come after us. Clergy, elders, whatever denomination you're from, let them come. Let them do their worst. Tell them we seek no quarter from you, nor will we give any. Say what the truth is, that this is a sin that cries out to God. It is a disorder. It is unnatural. It is a perversion. It is an abomination. Have the courage to use the words that God Almighty gave us in His holy inspired word. Tell them that you will defy them. Tell them, if you want to sue me, sue me. If you want to take my tax-exempt status, have it. Because the truth of God's word is not for sale. The truth about the sacrament of marriage is not up for negotiation. And these five lawbreakers, these five rebels on the Supreme Court, I quote God, why do the heathen rage? He who sits in the heavens will laugh. Those five Supreme Court justices will face Almighty God one day. But clergy, you have an obligation to herald God's word in the face of those wicked doers. 
to the world at large, in the press, in the media, and especially to your congregations. And if you give your congregations an example that they can follow, like the pastors of the ancient Roman Empire, your courage, your comfort, your words will give consolation and comfort and courage to your flock. You will be a good shepherd who is facing the wolf first and doing his best to protect his sheep. And if some of them do, if some of them do get persecuted, stand with them and don't flinch. Be like the early church. Stand together. Be one. Be one. Be unified. Be one. And God will honor our unity. And perhaps our courage and our strength will enable us to defeat this godless decision and send it back to hell where it came from. Be a good shepherd. You have two choices. I mean, you can try to raise your children by design or you will raise them by default. There are no perfect parents. We're going to get it wrong sometimes. If we have a plan, we've got a better chance of getting it right in the long run. There is something deep within the heart of every human being that longs for parental acceptance and approval. When does a boy become a man? Get a group of guys around and ask them that question. I don't think there's a certain age. Some men stay boys their whole life. I would say, uh, what, 16, 18 years old? Wow, that's a good question. When they get bar mitzvah? Well, I think when he has a child. So I just became at 56, yeah, 56 years old. Without the power of the Holy Spirit changing us and giving us power over our sin, we can't hope to be the dads that our kids need us to be. So, should we pass laws, either at a federal level or in, in all of our states, that exempt clergy from having to perform so-called homosexual marriage? In other words, should we shield them from discrimination, lawsuits, or any number of things that could happen to, to them as a result of them taking a stand? Now, at first blush, it seems, yeah, we should do that. No, absolutely not. We should decry the injustices they face. We should fight like hell to overturn or overthrow this insanity, but we should not pass a legal exemption for them. Please hear me out, all right? I'm gonna explain why. Pastors are our shepherds, charged to guard the flock. That's us. Jesus said that the good shepherd, what? He lays down his life for the sheep. It's the hireling. It's the one who views pastoring as a job, who flees when the wolf approaches and then leaves the sheep to be eaten. Please understand, I do not want righteous pastors persecuted for standing against this pernicious evil. However, I don't want any of us persecuted for standing for truth in this dark hour. There will be, in fact, there already are, brave Christians who for the love and fear of God and for the love of souls will not participate in any way with this sin that cries out to heaven. They won't sell flowers or wedding cakes. They won't play music at the reception. They won't emcee the reception. They won't make bridesmaid dresses or rent tuxedos to them. They won't sell them rings or build the gazebo or rent the sound system to them. And then there are employees of various counties and states who issue marriage licenses as a part of their duty. And some of them will refuse. Now, this is what practicing their religion means for them. It means defending God-ordained marriage and opposing this fraud. That's what living out their faith means. Now listen, all of those brave souls, the ones who are not pastors, they're going to face the same, if not greater persecution as a pastor 
who refuses to marry two misguided souls. The pastor of the flock should be the first to face the wolf, not the first to seek protection or an exemption. Think back with me 2,000 years. Pastors in the Roman Empire, they were often called bishops, priests, presbyters, whatever you want to call them. Pastors in the Roman Empire suffered bitter persecution. Thousands of them were martyred. They provided comfort, counsel, courage to their flocks because they endured the same trial of their faith. No law was passed to exempt them from burning incense to Caesar. And there would not have been a pastor or somebody in their flock who would have thought to approach Caesar to ask for an, ex an exemption for the pastors. It's ludicrous. So I ask you, how could today's clergy lead and protect their flocks? How could they give us an example of courage in the midst of suffering if they are exempted from the consequences of their faith? And because of their own exemption, and because of the guilt, the gnawing, nagging guilt that some of them would feel, they would say to their parishioners who wanted to stand up, wisdom is the better part of valor. God knows that you don't agree with what they're doing. They would begin to make excuses for their flock to join them in the arena where they're not confronting this godless treachery of marriage. When we come back from this break, I'm going to look at another sobering note. It's this. Judgment begins at the house of God. Do you want to get America out of the hands of wicked and unjust men and women who are destroying the republic before our eyes and put leadership back into the hands of righteous men and women so that we don't die as a nation? Well, you're talking about social revolution and there are rules in social revolution. We can look at the victorious social revolutions of the past, such as the end of slavery, the end of child labor, women's voting rights, the end of segregation, and so much more, and learn from their victories. Look at their actions, their images, their rhetoric, their sacrifices, and their final fruit. We will send you this series that originally cost $129, seven books for students, one teacher's guide, if you'll give a gift of any size and just pay for shipping and handling. Take advantage of it today. I'm explaining to you why having exemptions for pastors, priests, clerics, whatever you want to call them, preachers, why it's a bad idea. And I want to go at it from a, from a very different angle. And this is, in some ways, a little bit more sobering. I said it before the break. We have to remember that judgment begins with the house of God. That's what Peter wrote. And in the book of Ezekiel, during Ezekiel and Jeremiah's time, the angel came to Jerusalem and marked everyone on the head who sighed and who cried over the abominations that were being committed in Israel. And their lives were spared. But the avenging angel then began at God's command, starting at Solomon's temple, to slay those people. And the Bible says, he started with the elders, in other words, the, the, the priests, those who should have stopped the evils at hand, but did not. And by the way, one of the evils 
that was going on was that there were homosexual prostitution booths at Solomon's temple. And imagine the day when the negotiators who said to the temple priest, look, you've got a Baal idol in the temple already. You've got an Asherah pole in the temple already. Can't we just have this spiritual expression be present as well? Maybe they, had, maybe they had to apply three times, five times, ten times. But imagine the day when the high priest said, or through his, through his representative said, yes, tell them they can build the booths. They would have gone home elated. Elated. It's a great day. It's a great victory for religious freedom in Israel. But it was a betrayal of God's law. It was treachery against God himself himself. Now, let's go back to the angel. God told him, mark everyone who sighs and cries. And if they don't sigh and cry over the abominations, if they're used to it, if they become jaded, if they become callous, if they become a part of the very fiber that sustains this iniquity, kill them. Slay old and young. Begin at the temple. Begin with the elders. So I'm going to say this. <laughs> It's not going to make some of you happy, but it's the truth. As in yesteryear with the elders at the temple and the priests who caved in and allowed these abominable evils to, to happen, we as a people could never have plummeted so far into the abyss without the silence and the complicity of most clergy. Most clergy, not all. But most clergy have abandoned the culture wars. Well, now the war is coming to them. There's an old poem. I think you've probably heard it before. At least a phrase of it. It says, what if they gave a war and nobody came? Well, either the next line or one right after it says, the war would come to you. The war would come to you. And so, because so many of our clergy have abandoned the political realm, abandoned the culture wars, abandoned the public square, and made all kinds of excuses why it was God's will for them to abandon it and to accommodate these grotesque crimes against God, the shedding of innocent blood, the perversions that are going on around us, the, the saying, ah, children are a nuisance, they're a, they're, they're a problem, let's limit how many children we have. We don't want any more babies because they did that. Now the war is coming to them. And so to exempt them by law, no. Reverend bishops, fathers, reverend pastors, clergy, let our legislators know. Let them know from coast to coast. Tell them. You do not seek the protection of a government that so flagrantly tramples the laws of God and then persecutes your flock for opposing this madness. Tell them no. My view is this. Brave shepherds would not seek an exemption and cowardly hirings don't deserve one. I have been a leader in the pro-life movement for 30 years, and sadly we have not prevailed in our goal to make it a criminal act to kill an unborn baby. There's reasons why we have failed. I wrote this book, a humble plea, to Catholic bishops, to evangelical clergy, and to lay people explaining where we went wrong and what we have to do to prevail. We've made this available as a PDF online for free. I encourage you to go and download your own copy. Why does a nice guy like me keep getting thrown in jail? I have been arrested almost 50 times and spent over a year of my life locked up in various prison facilities. And I wrote a book, many books. In fact, one of them is called, Why Does a Nice Guy Like Me Keep Getting Thrown in Jail? It's a theological work, answering those who say that the church should not be involved in politics or that we should retreat. I encourage you to get it. In fact, get one and give it to your pastor.
Paul wrote that we are all one body and that as Christians, when one member of the body suffers, we all suffer. I believe it, I don't remember which of the founders of the Republic it was who said kind of jokingly to the people who were fomenting revolution against King George III, he said, we can hang together or we will all hang separately. That's what we're facing, people. We're facing the unraveling of this culture. And if we allow them to separate us from each other, we are going to be the weaker for it. Um, Alito said in his, uh, in his dissent, he said, I assume that those who cling to old beliefs will be able to whisper their thoughts in the recesses of their homes. But if they repeat those views in public, they will risk being labeled as bigots and treated as such by governments, employers, and schools. In other words, Alito said, get ready for persecution because it's coming. Government, state, local, federal governments are going to descend upon those who resist the new orthodoxy. Employers are going to say, if you won't do this, you're fired. Schools are now going to be teaching our children things that were unspeakable just a few years ago in my lifetime, things that they are going to say are normal and praiseworthy and beautiful and expressions of goodness, blah, blah, blah. You could not even discuss them in mixed company, much less teach these abominable sins to small children. We have an obligation to stand together and to resist and Giving pastors an exemption will not help. And it will make their condemnation of this evil ring hollow. If I can say something and fear no repercussion, then is it really courage? If I've asked the state to protect me so that I can say what the Lord wants me to say, am I trusting in the Lord? Or am I trusting in the exemption that the state gave me? Let them come after us. Clergy, elders, whatever denomination you're from, let them come. Let them do their worst. Tell them we seek no quarter from you, nor will we give any. Say what the truth is, that this is a sin that cries out to God. It is a disorder. It is unnatural. It is a perversion. It is an abomination. Have the courage to use the words that God Almighty gave us in His holy inspired word. Tell them that you will defy them. Tell them, if you want to sue me, sue me. If you want to take my tax-exempt status, have it. Because the truth of God's word is not for sale. The truth about the sacrament of marriage is not up for negotiation. And these five lawbreakers, these five rebels on the Supreme Court, I quote God, why do the heathen rage? He who sits in the heavens will laugh. Those five Supreme Court justices will face Almighty God one day. But clergy, you have an obligation to herald God's word in the face of those wicked doers, to the world at large, in the press, in the media, and especially to your congregations. And if you give your congregations an example that they can follow, like the pastors of the ancient Roman Empire, your courage, your comfort, your words will give consolation and comfort and courage to your flock. You will be a good shepherd who is facing the wolf first and doing his best to protect his sheep. And if some of them do, if some of them do get persecuted, stand with them and don't flinch. Be like the early church. Stand together. Be one. Be one. Be unified. Be one. And God will honor our unity and perhaps our courage and our strength 
will enable us to defeat this godless decision and send it back to hell where it came from. Be a good shepherd.